Hey guys, this is Ms. Holland again. Um, here is your next lecture, which is on photosynthesis. We're going to call this part one because this is a really, really long lecture. Um, and there will be obviously two or three parts. So let's go ahead and start from the very beginning. Here, and again, please make sure to pause this at any time to actually um, write down any of these fun facts that I'm going to share with you all. Or simply just watch this lecture a million times. All right, so here we go. Here's our leaf. If I were to take a cross section of that leaf, this is actually what it looks like. So this is actually what's known as your mesophyll. Remember from our very first lecture on ATP, meso means middle, phyll means leaf. So this is the middle of the leaf. You also have all your xylem and phloem, which are your veins that are going to be bringing in the water to um, your leaf to help with photosynthesis. And there's a new guy that I want you guys to add that's actually known as the stomata. Not the stroma, but the stomata. Stomata are these little tiny holes that literally will open and close, open and close, to actually allow um, oxygen to actually flow in, and will actually allow, um, or sorry, allow CO2 to flow in, and then allow oxygen to come out. So this is actually a process of moving the um elements in and out of the actual leaf. So that's the stomata. Now, each one of these circles here is a cell. Okay, so not a chloroplast, not a chlorophyll, but an actual cell. So let's pull this guy out inside your cell. If you guys were to look at him. Again, you have your nucleus, you have all of these little tiny green dots, which are your chloroplasts. And in every single plant, every single cell, each one of these circles, there's about 30 to 40 chloroplasts per each one of those cells. So when you guys look at this underneath the microscope, this is why all there's a billion and two green dots. And then these empty spaces that you saw underneath the microscopes as well is known as your vacuole. So this is a V here. So nucleus, vacuole, and then your chloroplast. Now if I were to take this single cell, again, remembering that inside your leaf you have many, many cells, okay, we're going to take that single cell out, and then I'm now going to look at just this one little dot here, which is your chloroplast. This in turn is what he actually looks like. Now your chloroplast, okay, and we talked about this before in our mini lecture, is made up of a couple essential elements. Your thylakoid is your single disc that's allowing the actual sun light to actually capture within the chlorophyll. You have your stacks of thylakoids, or actually known as your grana. And then we've got this empty spot in the circle here that's known as your stoma. Not your stromata, but your stroma. Okay, And this in turn is where your Calvin cycle is actually going to take place. Now, before we actually begin the process of photosynthesis, let's talk about a few kind of key words here. During photosynthesis, we have a couple of terms that we're going to be using. Autotrophs, auto means automatic, or anything that's going to be making their own food. And so there's two types of autotrophs that we've talked about before, photo and chemo. Photo autotroph is simply organisms that use photosynthesis to change light into sugar. Chemo autotrophs are organisms that are going to be using chemicals and changing them into sugar. Heterotrophs, on the other hand, hetero means different in Latin. And so those are going to be anything that's going to eat, anything that's different from themselves. So I'm going to, I'm a human, I'm going to eat a plant. I'm a human, I'm going to eat an animal um, as such. And so we are usually heterotrophs. Now, a chloroplast, just to, for those of you that really want that definition, because that's just the way that you work. Okay, here is your actual definition here. Sorry, I'm making you guys seasick. Okay, chloroplast is um, an organelle that will capture light energy known as photons. And this is a new word for all of you as well that you do need to know. So it's the actual light is known as photons. And it's part of the light spectrum of wavelengths, which is your void GBIF, your red, orange, yellow, green, blue. And this light, if you guys really think about it, has traveled 160 million kilometers from the sun to our planet, and these plants with these little teeny tiny microscopic dots of chloroplast can actually take that sunlight, that photon of light that's untouchable to us, and actually convert it into a molecule of sugar. 
plants are literally magicians. They're amazing. So let's talk about these photons. Photons are, again, in the form of light. So here is our light spectrum. Now, remember, inside of our chloroplast, you have these discs that are known as thylakoids. Inside the thylakoids, which we'll get to here in a second, are these pigments that are known as chlorophyll. And so chlorophyll is going to absorb and reflect different wavelengths. And so when we talk about wavelengths here, guys, this is what I'm talking about. Wavelengths are part of what's known as the vis visible spectrum. So if you go smaller, we're talking about UV rays, gamma radiation, the Hulk, right? If you guys go a little bit larger, we're talking about like radio waves. This is why you guys can listen to the radio here in Cota de Casa from a station that's down in San Diego. So it can travel a lot farther. So really, really short, a little bit longer. And this is actually the wavelengths that we can actually see with the visible eye. Now, these wavelengths also come in different forms. And so they themselves are spaced to really, really small versus really, really large. And so this is why during the winter, when we have not a lot of light, we actually start to get the accessory pigments that will start to reflect the reds, the oranges, and the yellows because they are absorbing everything else. During the summer, the green is in turn going to be reflected because we're getting a lot of this short light length and a lot of this um, long wavelength because the sun is closer to the planet. So this specifics you guys don't need to know, but this is just to kind of help you guys out here. As the wavelength increases, the energy decreases. So the shorter the wavelength, the greater the energy. Now to give you guys a little kind of helpful hint here, Chlorophyll A and B, which are two types of pigments that we're going to be dealing with here, chlorophyll A specifically absorbs a spectrum of about 680. And so that's your reds and your oranges. So we're way over here on this side is chlorophyll A. Well, chlorophyll B is going to be um, absorbing the spectrums that are a little bit smaller. And so because chlorophyll A and B work together, you end up creating that green light is not what they want. And so that in turn is what is reflected in the plant. And so that is what we see. Because again, our eyeballs are designed evolutionary to actually see what the light is reflecting, not what the light is actually being absorbed. So it would be very interesting philosophically to actually look at plants as their true colors. They would not be green. They would be a brownish, reddish, purple, which would be kind of cool to see our, our earth in a different frame of light. All right, so here we go. Past philosoph philosophy here. Green wavelength is not absorbed, okay? This is the biggest thing I need for you guys to understand and remember. Chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B do not like green, and therefore that is what is reflected. They do like all the other pigments, including some of our accessory pigments like our carotenoids, our xanthophylls, things like that. Now, how do we actually figure this out? So as you guys all know, if you have me at Tesoro High School, I'm kind of a big history buff. And so let's go and talk about the history of photosynthesis. This process of light, what plants like, was actually proven about 100 years ago by this guy by the name of T.W. Engelman. Now, he actually studied algae. So any of you guys like water plants? Algae is actually a type of either freshwater or saltwater plant. And he exposed them to a prism, kind of like a disco ball. And he noticed that the red and the blue light made the algae produce oxygen, which in turn caused oxygen-loving bacteria to grow. So this is kind of what it, what it looked like, okay? He put this freshwater algae on an agar plate, okay? And he put this little disco ball up on the top here that actually reflects all these different colors of light onto the actual algae. And then that in turn allowed bacteria to actually grow in this specific area. And so now we know that the green area was the area that algae did not like, whereas the reds, the oranges, the yellows, and the blues were the light spectrum that the algae did like. Guys, this is um, part one of photosynthesis. Please remember that your thylakoids here are what is going to be attracting our